Proteomics excites me because it allows you to get at the biological players and mechanisms, and it also allows you to quickly get at the targets in, say, an early cancer detection setting, but then also to actionable targets for future diagnostic assays. I think proteomics has been sort of on the back burner in many ways to transcriptomics and genomics, but it provides so much value. And so that really is fundamental to everything. You know, are we using the right technology? Is it able to answer that question? Is it able to give actionable value at the end? In the early cancer detection field, we are centered principally on looking at liquid biopsies and typically clinical accessible liquid biopsy fluids. And of course, the holy grail for that is blood, plasma, and serum. We really have a primary mission of detecting lethal cancers as early as possible because therapeutic outcomes are so much more positive when we can catch lethal cancers early versus catching them later, for example, post-metastasis. SEER came on our radar and are actually the first institute in the world as a client to have a proteograph installed, vetted, and then we are now running samples with that instrument. So it's become really a, a key component of our proteomics workflow for cancer early detection and also for therapeutics and we're using for a variety of projects at OHSU at large. We could see the, the huge advantage that proteograph provided in terms of low sample input amounts required, very short durations of time to prepare samples, and then acquisition times on the mass spec were so greatly reduced versus traditional methods that we have the sufficient statistical power to really find even subtle differentials in terms of biomarkers in the various fluid types that we were analyzing. So my experience with SEER has been incredibly positive, and I would say that's true for our whole proteomics group. We really were able to be supported by and work closely with several members of the SEER team. And beyond even the sample preparation, SEER has been incredibly supportive on the mass spec side too. And we've really been able to grow with SEER on that platform as well, talking about acquisition strategies, column and trap types to use, and methods. I'll have to say that I've worked with a number of different companies with first generation instruments, often in early access type programs. And the, there can be a, a high degree of heterogeneity, so to speak, with the level of support that one gets and the number of problems that one can encounter with and sometimes somewhat beta instrumentation. And that has not been the case with Sears. So my experience learning the proteograph along with uh, two colleagues actually was much less daunting than I expected. Everything is barcoded, the reagents and supplies are all sort of self-contained and provided by SEER, and really it's a matter of setup that takes you know, 30 to 40 minutes at most, and one gets faster and faster at that. We typically set up the liquid handler in the morning, and it completes a run of uh, preparation run for 16 samples in seven hours. It, we then do the peptide assay to determine yields and consistency of the measurements after that, easily within a standard workday. Something that's often not appreciated enough is the backend analytics. And SEER not only has internal capability for doing that, but it's developing a user pipeline so that we don't, ha as users, have to recreate the wheel to mine most effective and actionable data out of the data sets that we get from the proteograph and mass spec. The proteograph has the attributes that we've already discussed about being able to sample across the dynamic range of plasma with high consistency in a format that allows for scalable studies. So that's an immense breakthrough in, uh, versus traditional methods that, where that just wasn't possible. The TIMS TOF with its low sample input requirements, its fast duty cycle, and of course its ion mobility based separation allows us to put smaller amounts of sample into the mass spec and then probe more deeply into that proteome complexity. So that gives us a couple of different advantages. For example, allowing us to do things like go in with data dependent acquisition and sample with uh, that acquisition strategy and then perhaps build a spectral library and go back subsequently and use data independent acquisition to either further mine sort of the samples for the actionable data that we can get out of them. We approached our initial study with real clinical samples from our biorepository with SEER, focusing on prostate cancer. So the pilot study in prostate cancer not only allowed us to test our proteograph, but also to generate a proof of concept data to unlock large sample sets, but it also allowed us to do a power calculation 
to determine how large of a sample set we would really need to go after. Really the proteograph, particularly when coupled with the short gradient times, mass spec acquisition times of the Timstoff, really makes this for the first time a study of 500 to 1,000 cases possible. It really was not possible before. You could get at that depth, but it would be with one sample with a tremendous amount of sample input, labor for preparation, and then acquisition time. Prior to the proteograph being implemented in CEDAR in our early detection wing of the Knight Cancer Institute, we were really very reluctant to go directly into clinical accessible fluids like blood, plasma, and serum because of their complexity and their huge dynamic range and the historical demonstrations that so much work has, had been required using traditional methods for depletion and fractionation that it really, we knew this just wasn't feasible for doing a, a study of any power and having the statistical outputs that we would need. And in this way, we can skip that step in some ways and go directly into our discovery and validation and then clinical deployment in the same fluid, which is a huge advantage going forward for our early detection studies. And then ask the harder shade of gray questions, for example, in the prostate cancer field, can our signatures be predictive 5, 10, 15, 20 years out of diagnosis and really indicate how far out in time a lethal cancer might arise? And we're looking at a number of different cohorts that have these types of not only diagnostic specimens, but also prospectively collecting specimens so we can march our way back in time once we find a signature and ask how early was that predictive. In addition, there's some fundamental questions about in the early cancer detection field where we can use model systems to model different indications in cancer, can perturb those systems and ask what is the effect on the outputs proteomically from those systems. And we can use the proteograph as well for some of those systems. We're at a really amazing time in terms of technology development, in terms of things like the proteograph, to sample fluids and tissues, to be able to do this with multiple omics, not only looking as we have traditionally at RNA and DNA, but now at protein, probably proteiforms, maybe even post-translational modifications. That's gonna greatly expand the lens at which we can ex explore these types of fluids and tissues. If we could find markers that not only benefited the diagnostic side of the clinical equation, perhaps augmenting traditional PSA testing, maybe even replacing prostate biopsy. That would be a huge win. As a stretch goal, if we could expand those signatures to long-term surveillance populations and really be able to predict in the future, maybe even decades out, whether or not a male is gonna have prostate cancer that becomes something that's gonna be clinically uh, detrimental, Having that long-term predictive power would be enormously beneficial to the patients as well.